some of the other webinars in this series. So again, this webinar is one of a series helping you adapt and respond to the current pandemic. If you have not listened to some of the other webinars that we've had, please do so. A lot of great, great content on a variety of topics that really are, are here to help you take the solutions that you already have and give you some ways you can adapt them, some best practices um, for how you can get through this time um, and really succeed and continue to provide your customers with the experience they need. Um, because even though we're all facing a ton of disruption right now, you've got your employees working from home, you're getting lots of calls like we're talking about today, um, your customers are going to remember how they were treated. You know, they're really going, it's going to stick with them in these times, the people who helped them and the people who didn't. So it's really, really important. Um, again, in, in this topic today, when you have a ton of calls coming in and maybe not enough resources to handle them, um, it's going to be really important uh, to do what you can to still handle those needs. Um, you know, we're seeing in a lot of industries a dramatic increase in customer contacts. I've talked to customers who have said upwards of 300% increase in calls. Um, and your staffing is, is unpredictable. Maybe you have a lot of people who are out or people who, who can't really work from home um, as many hours due to having to, you know, homeschool their kids or take care of, of family members. And so you have this, this problem of too many calls and too few agents. But these long wait times are going to lead to poor outcomes across the board. You know, your best case scenario is that it's a really bad customer experience for your customer and, and they're going to be unhappy. That's the best case scenario. And, and the worst case is some of these calls right now are really urgent with life-changing situations. And so to not be able to allow those customers to get through in a timely manner can have a really, really negative outcome. Um, on your, your customers and on your business. So when we talk about strategies to deflect calls, it's not just about avoidance. We're not saying we just want you guys to go away. We want the calls to go away. Um, that's not what deflection is about. You know, when done correctly, deflection is about handling these inquiries with the right resources in the right channel. We want to help you the way that we can get you what you need as quickly as possible. And in a lot of cases, that's not going to be the phone. That's going to be self-service or some other digital channel that we'll talk about. So again, it's not about, hey, go away, too many people are calling. It's really about getting you what you need as quickly as you can. So we'll talk about seven strategies to do this. And we've got a lot of content to get through today. So without further ado, I will hand things over to Daniel Ziv. Thank you, Kelly, and uh, thank you everybody for joining. We definitely appreciate your time. You know, it's it's a uh, it's a stressful and and busy time for everybody, uh, so this is very much appreciated. And first and foremost, hope everybody is safe and healthy. Um, I will just ju continue on on Kelly's uh, train of thought here, and 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 really, it's everything is changing around us. You know, almost every vertical, every customer we've talked to is saying everything is different. Um, and to, to continue on, on Kelly's note there, call volumes increasing significantly for everybody. These are also not just, it's not just the volume that's increasing. A lot of these calls have, uh, we're using speech analytics to measure the level of emotion in these calls. So we see an increase in stress and emotion. A lot of these calls, uh, as Kelly noted, are urgent issues. They're not just regular questions. And there's a lot of uncertainty on the topics themselves, which are changing daily. It's not just Everybody's talking about the, the, the pandemic, but there's different variations of the questions, and those are actually changing. Initially, we saw a lot of calls about the pandemic. Now we're seeing things, you know, we just talked to a customer that talks, saying there's an increase on the stimulus package and, and questions about how do I get my money, and these things are evolving almost daily. Also, a lot of these calls require empathy, um, especially the critical calls. It's not just about getting information that's important and critical, but some of them are people in, in – desperate situations where we really need somebody to talk to and, and, and help them get through this. On the other side, which is adding more to the strain, is, is, as was noted, is, is the available resources. So people are working from home. Some of them have reduced staff. Others are adding staff, but those are temporary staff that have less experience, less, less knowledge. Um, and even the experienced agents are in a difficult situation where they don't have the same level of IT support. Their bandwidth may be lower at home. 
Uh, they can't just turn to a supervisor or another agent as, as a peer. Um, and the new questions are different, so they may not have, their existing experience may de may not be as useful as uh, you know. And, and also, there's policy changes that are happening as we speak, and they may not be aware of all these changes. Um, so it's becoming more challenging now. Uh, the strategy really uh, is about identifying. I, I would call it the simple 80-20 rule, right? 80% of these, especially if the increase is significant, you have to identify, you know, what are the simpler things? Uh, what are things that could be addressed through self-service or through other digital channels? So we're using speech analytics um, to identify the recurrent questions, the simple questions, the shorter questions, um, you know, dialogue that can, can be a one or two minute um, and that has a very clear and simple answer um, or resolution. And, and those that have less emotions in them, that less escalation, those hopefully we get to that big chunk and identify that 80 percent of those calls that we want to deflect or uh, or provide answers on another channel and then we also have that hopefully clears the way to be able to bring in and address the more critical issues that are life-changing events that it's a vulnerable population whether it's older population or people that are stressed we've had input from people um with calls where people are threatening to hurt themselves. So that's definitely a call where we want to make sure we're there and, and address that, that challenge. Um, complex and unique situations that don't have a simple answer, that require some thinking and some creative uh, solutions. And then those calls that do require human empathy, we want those to get through and we want to provide that, that lifeline and that human touch, uh, which is so critical. Now, um, we did we, we we do a lot of these research surveys and and this is the research that was done before the pandemic. So, um, but I thought it was important. It was called the digital tipping point. I, I thought it's it's important to bring up because even in times of normal uh, business, uh, we see that um, when it, when somebody has a critical issue, not a normal you know I just want to find out what my balance is, but a really more demanding or critical issue, they do want to people tend to all the generations want to talk to a human being. They typically had two options is to speak with somebody on the phone or to go to a branch and to, to speak to somebody in person. That option of, of talking to somebody in person is really no longer an option in most cases. So if you look at that two right columns, we have a very big, sometimes 50% of people on a critical issue want to talk to somebody. And that's really now mostly the phone channel. If you look at the silent generation of baby boomers, the yellow and light blue, they're they're highest here and in some cases in this situation they're most at risk if it's a healthcare issue so um this just shows that it, it is still we're all we're going to talk about a lot of other channels and a lot of options but we want to keep that you know part of the strategy is to make sure we still have open that channel keep that channel open for human to human interaction when the issue is really critical and requires that and long term, this is really where loyalty is built. Um, we see that humans, again, this is from that same report, the digital tipping point where we talked about, we, we found that 79% of, of customers want to talk to, to uh, somebody uh, and 74 don't like dealing with companies that don't have a phone number on the website. 65% feel that they receive better service when they can talk on the phone. Again, especially important when it's a critical issue. Um, so. Again, what, the, the way to use speech analytics and the way we're seeing customers are using it is they're using, they're building a set of categories that look for those repeatable, simpler calls um, that can uh, be self-served and in parallel looking for those critical, emotional, you know, longer, complex calls. And speech can do that quite well, like a category that, a call that falls into multiple categories and is very long and it has a lot of holds or escalations. It's probably a more complex issue that needs to get through. Um, calls that are shorter have only few categories associated with them and those categories are predefined and, and well done um, can probably be self-serve and we're creating that 80-20 um, strategy and most importantly once we identify what are the issues that we want to serve on other channels we need to update those other channels and that's what the other speakers will touch on is really updating your IVA, IVR, your community, your, your uh, online website, your mobile app, um, to make sure that those are up to date with the questions, the new questions that are coming in. And that, I think, combinations allows us to deflect the less critical calls and make room uh, for the more ones. And, and I'll f finalize on this note. We did touch on it on some of the previous webinars. We have an initiative for existing speech analytics customers where we've created some of these out-of-the-box categories that help create that differentiation. Some of them are around industry specific uh, categories associated with the crisis. Some are more business impact and, and financial impact and human impact. Uh, and even things like the employee desired language that we want to see to, to express that empathy. 
Um, and those are provided free of charge to all existing speech customers, and they, it's an easy process to import that file. We can do that for you. We can send you the file to do it yourself. We've also done a lot of tuning recently for terminology that's changed, like coronavirus and COVID-19. So if, if uh, you've tried to find these calls and had an issue, uh, we've heard very good feedback from people going through the quick tuning process, which again, we're offering free of charge to any customer. You can just open a uh, support, a Varant uh, Connect case, uh, through Varant Connect support uh, case study and, uh, sorry, support case, and we will uh, engage with you and set that up for you. So, so hopefully that'll help you get started and we'd love to hear uh, any other ways we can help or ways you've managed to uh, build a strategy uh, using these tools to, to cope with the crisis. With that, I'll pass it uh, on to Tracy, I think. Great. <clears throat> thank you, Daniel. And, and thank you again, everybody, for joining. I would uh, say either good morning or afternoon, but like most of you, uh, time and day right now <laughs> seems to uh, to take on a whole new kind of relevance. So appreciate uh, the opportunity to, to speak with you. I'm going to cover probably the next three strategies here as we look at, at how to support too many calls and too few agents and in ways that we can enable and, and support you. And I would say that these next two um, strategies are really what I would like to compare to um, kind of, you know, wash your hands and avoid touching your face, right? They're all things that we should be doing um, and should have been doing for some time, but they're even more critical right now. So the first one let's take a look at, which is kind of preempting the call, right? Um, because no doubt, as, as Daniel mentioned, there is a number of calls coming in. So how do we preempt that? Um, what are some strategies to do uh, that for you? So as we take a look at it, really we would say that the key here is all just about transparency and educating customers about the options you have. And within each of your organizations, right, you've made different investments on options and opportunities for where you can leverage uh, different self-service to allow them to get the information that they need um, as quickly as possible. So whether that be uh, sending out emails to inform them of, of the current situation and where and how they can go to for help. Um, I've seen a number of those come across even for myself with some of the companies I do business with, um, and I actually am paying attention to those. Uh, website notifications are always a good place, right, to inform your customers on um, how you're helping them, where they can go to get in better touch with you. And social media is one that we would say, you know, at this point in time, uh, social media really kind of puts the social into social distancing, and, and we see a lot of people engaging in that channel. And although there are a lot of companies who have strategies around social media and how to provide service, et cetera, through that, um, there's others that haven't made that leap, and we would just encourage you um, to engage in this channel. And even if it's high-level transparency or messaging, uh, we're seeing that a lot of uh, a lot of folks are heading to this as a way just to even kind of start their journey to get information that they need to with the company. So again, that's kind of our, our washing our hands, right? Like let's make sure that we educate our customers about self-service options that they have um, before there's an issue, but. Um, you know, what happens when they do call in and, and how do we have a strategy, right, or how do we engage strategies to avoid um, or at least make aware, right, of, of waiting on hold. Uh, my mother-in-law uh, had an issue the other day uh, with a SIM chip uh, in one of her SIMs, and she ended up calling in. She sat on hold for seven hours. Now, she was fine doing that, um, and, and when I talked to her about it a little bit to, to kind of get her mindset around it, she said, oh, well, every once in a while I got a message telling me how long it was going to be or that I was still connected, and, and I just, you know, continued to do my stuff while I sat on hold because it was important that I talk to somebody because I had to get it fixed. And we'll see some of that, right? I mean, this is unusual time and a regular time, and so we're going to see those things, and people have a different threshold, but in all cases, Right, we want to continue with making sure uh, that we provide as many options as possible. Um, for those, as Daniel mentioned, that this is a very personal critical item, uh, we want to make sure that those folks are able to talk to, to a live agent. And for others, um, we want to make sure that they're aware, right, of what other opportunities and self-service uh, initiatives we can do. So whether that be doing callbacks and scheduling calls, um, whether it be during the wait time, right, offering different self-service channels for them to make them more aware and educate 
and even some initiatives were right, within Smart IVR to be able to add some more conversation and information just through that front end channel to help with you on that. Verit provides uh, IVR um, solutions and services for a number of customers, and I'll tell you, in some of our applications, we're seeing 200, 300% spikes. Um, and as part of that, right, the messaging is very critical to make sure that people understand um, the environment, what's going on, and, and where we can offer them other assistance. So those two strategies, um, again, are things that, that we should all be doing all the time. And in this regular business, right, we want to make sure that we're paying extra attention to them. I'm going to move here to our fourth strategy, uh, which, is, which is what we refer to as kind of make your self-service smarter. And in this section, I'm going to focus on one of really variant kind of areas of expertise, which is around the area of automation, and specifically intelligent virtual assistants, or as you may here refer to, IVAs. And later on in other steps that we have um, that some of our other experts will talk to you about, we're just going to discuss other automation and self-service um, solutions like KM and communities um, for those opportunities. But in this particular section, um, we're going to focus on uh, the IVA and, and how IVA can help and how we can make those smarter, as well as what we're doing for Verant um, and what we're seeing, quite honestly, uh, with this particular opportunity. So smarter IVAs at scales, when we talk about making self-service smarter, there's various degrees, right, of, of how we engage this type of technology to support our customer. And all of those different degrees of smarts, right, require different um, intelligence and investment, and we'll get into that in a little bit. But they also provide different return, right, for the enterprise, and in some cases, different experience for our customers. There's no right or wrong answer, right, to where you are within your journey if you're currently leveraging an IVA to, you know, to support your self-service initiative. For some folks, uh, just quick answers um, on kind of obvious questions, informational type things, um, serve the purpose that you need. And in other cases, you need to add a little bit more intelligence and smarts to that and kind of help people find answers, but, you know, faster than they could have before. So now we're guiding to kind of more information. We're becoming more knowledgeable. Uh, the way that we look at this, we start to get into kind of more of a helpful stage where we can maybe do something for the user. Um, they could have done it themselves, but maybe we can do it in a better, more automated way. And as we move up kind of that value chain, what we look at is, is creating smarter IVAs that are experts where perhaps the IVA can then, from a self-service standpoint, uh, tell customers uh, what they need to know, even when they don't know how to ask for it, right? And so then we can get into some more proactive work with self-service and, and drive that. And then finally, as we take a look at it, um, and we look at more of a coach type IVA um, or intelligent virtual system, that's really where we're doing something for your customer or your user uh, that they should have done, but maybe they forgot. And again, all of these different levels of, of smart self-service can serve different purposes, um, but there are um, things that need to be incorporated and best practices and journeys that you have to take in order to enable this. And so I'll quickly go into um, kind of that enterprise approach and what that looks like. So if you really want to drive up kind of that value chain of driving smart self-service uh, for your customers, uh, as well as your employees, we'll talk about that a little bit. There's really uh, the most critical thing I think to understand is that an intelligent virtual assistant, an IVA, um, is not a single thing, right? Lots of lots of um, organizations look at it as it's a single piece of code or it's a single piece of technology. It's really many things that have to come together in order to get you up that chain from just answering questions to really driving in a proactive way how you can self-service someone. And if we take a look at it from what Barrett has done, is, is we look at this in kind of six different buckets. Um, the first bucket is, is intent libraries, right? So trained um, intent libraries that you need to leverage across multiple use cases and, and being able to leverage those based on real world conversations with human validated data is super critical. And, and having tens and thousands of those at your disposal are, are very important as you work through that chain of value. The other piece is, is conversational AI tools designed for business users. Now, the keynote in this is business users. Uh, folks within the contact center, folks that are managing the business users, they know uh, what and how they take these insights that we can drive 
from these smart self service conversations and really impact and support the business. And so the tools that we give and tools that people have to use have to be focused on um, on the business user being able to do it right and and, and not super special IT uh, required skills. Integration platforms to, in, to enable, um, you know, different data from interfaces. When we talk about driving more smarter self-service, specifically with IVAs, having context and content is critical. And the way that you get context and content is by integrating to third-party systems of records. And so having that integration platform is key. Um, proprietary engines to handle thousands of different use cases and intents is important as well as being able to support other engines because uh, lots of enterprises and organizations have made investments into IVAs and they may be various stages of what they do and, and can and cannot do on that value change and we need to be able to support that. The last two are, are super critical which is the expert technologies um, and, and practitioners. Right, having people who've deployed these types of solutions for 15 years, super important, um, as well as, as part of, of what we do with Invariant, right, is, is a lot of connecting to different contact center um, services and applications that you already have and are familiar with, uh, without disruption to the business. So that's how we look at making uh, the IBA smarter um, from that perspective. And, and one of the critical things I would say that when we talk to and engage with customers, is where do I start, right? Like how do I start with, with building a smart self-service initiative? And we would say that it's critical to do um, blueprinting for that. Uh, it's a practice that we've come up with, which is called an AI blueprint. If you think of it at the highest level, it's really around the idea of data-driven development. So as Daniel said, I'll give you an example. Maybe we understand that certain types of conversations that you're having today within your contact center do have a lot of emotion around them, and we need to treat those in a very special way right now. That may not be something that we want to automate right away. Um, perhaps conversations have multiple characteristics and turns. Maybe we can have good success with that. So being able to take conversation data, information that you already have within your environment, run that through our tools and analysis and provide you a blueprint for success, helps make these things smarter outside, you know, out of the gate, right? And that's super critical. Another way that we enable um, smarter self-service is by taking our 15 years of experience of driving IVA um, solutions in the market and packaging those for you for kind of five key areas and use cases that we see come up again and again, and take those that have been um, created specifically with KPIs and time to market, um, and built for real world kind of implementations and allow you to leverage those out of the gate. So um, instead of just trying to kind of build as it goes along or try to figure out what you need to do, we've already done a lot of that work for you. And these starter, um, these starter uh, packs really um, leverage, like I said, years of, of production and experience. And in a time right now, it's very important that we do that um, so that we can get solutions up quickly and effectively and that we know are going to drive what we need to in value. Just to give you a quick example of what one of those starter packs looks like for us, we have a human resource one that we've leveraged um, for the last probably eight years. And it covers a number of different areas, um, uh, hundreds of different intents. Um, but from a usability standpoint, what we've seen by deploying this, because we already know what works within the organization based on all the experience, 67% reduction to live chat for HR um, folks, and, and really millions of questions answered, um, able to support peak scenarios, um, and, and then, of course, broad capacity and coverage. When you develop a smarter self-service um, strategy through an IBA, um, you should and you can expect to see you know, extremely good uh, improvements and results. And so we've got a number of case studies you can always link to, but just to highlight a few, we have seen um, in our deployments over the past years, 83% um, deflection in live chat volume, 44% um, cost reductions, um, you know, numerous reduction in overall live chat, uh, as well as money saved. So again, that level of, of smartness and, and where we can really enable that is driving these, these significant uh, results and experiences. Uh, 
one of the things that Daniel mentioned is so, so how can how can variants uh, help you today <laughs> as a variant customer? So as Daniel and, and Kelly mentioned, every business is affected, and, and we're here to help you today. We've seen drastic uh, within the conversations with our current IVAs. We've seen drastic and immediate shifts for our remote workers and all of the change, and, and quite honestly, significant concern for employees' health and well-being. And as a result, we've been monitoring kind of the conversations of our IVAs that have happened um, during some of this scenario. And what we've seen is kind of the following. Um, within our standard uh, HR and kind of IT help desk starter packs and use cases, a lot of conversations kind of early on were around things that you would set, you would expect, uh, setting my password, work from home access, those types of scenarios. But we saw a, a peak, right, happen a handful of weeks ago. Uh, with conversations where there was starting to be more process and procedure stuff around working from home and how we can do that. We saw about a 29% on average increase, and, and this traditionally would kind of uh, really put stresses on your IT support team, your internal call centers, right, your IT support team and your HR support team. So we saw significant shifts up there, and um, but because we were able to deploy a smart self-service approach with our IVA, we saw minimal increases in um, calls and live chats going to those organizations. As a result, we created a work from home intelligent assistant um, that is really focused on these primary things. So how do we help and enable our employees and our agents in this new work and home environment? It's a set language model uh, that covers these kind of following uh, key items on how they can set up and policies, travel information, um, and, and the like, and what we are offering to our variant customers um, is this IVA and this language model for you to take advantage of. So the variant work from host intelligence system is going to be offered to all of our variant cloud customers at 90 days with no licensing cost, um, just a small setup fee. And uh, we hope that you can take advantage of it, and we hope that it can help enable and support your employees. Um, and we appreciate, again, the opportunity. It is my pleasure to turn over for kind of strategy number five, which is around knowledge management, over to uh, Heather Richards. So Heather, I'll let you take it from here. Great, thanks Tracy. Um, I'm gonna spend some time talking about optimizing your knowledge base as the fifth strategy to sort of address the, those two key questions that, that we've been looking at. Um, the, the issues of both high call demand, uh, how to deal with that, um, as well as providing real-time agent support. Um, and these are agents that most likely are, are now working from home. So when you look at variant knowledge management solutions, key to addressing both of those issues that, that I just highlighted is knowledge management. With, with the right knowledge management, you can actually start providing in real time uh, the information necessary uh, to allow both customers to effectively self-serve um, and agents to be more effective as well. And I'm going to talk through a, a bit about how we can do that on both sides, both sides of that issue, um, looking at decreased training times and rapid upskilling of agents on new subjects. And this, this is an issue that I've seen reoccurring quite, quite a lot over the last few weeks within our customer base. Um, key to this is that Verant KM technology, um, actually because of the AI involved in it, works straight out of the box from day one. Um, and this means that deployment time can be weeks, not months, with the aim of actually automating the, the creation, consumption, and sharing of the most important knowledge you need to get out to your customers and agents as quickly as possible. Um, and then inbuilt analytics actually allow you to monitor these issues as they unfold. Um, so key to you know this, this differentiation that we offer um, is important because it, what it does is provide a level of agility that actually helps your business adapt and respond to the, the challenges that are all of us are experiencing right now through, through this crisis. Um, looking specifically now about why knowledge for customers is, is so important. Um, and, and this is really the self-service angle that we've heard quite a bit about from, from, from Tracy um, and Daniel. Um, your, your customers right now are in a completely different personal situations and they probably were only a month ago. Um, new circumstances, they have new questions. Um, and some of those questions are, are new. And what's interesting for me is to speak to our customers and say, you know, actually we, we were pretty confident a few months ago what 80% of, of the inbound calls were going to be about. That, that everything's been turned on its head. 
um, those models are no longer necessarily the, the same ones that they were a few months, even a few weeks ago in, in some cases. So customers are wanting to have a different kind of conversation with us, um, more conversational, more, more emotional, and um, we, we've touched on that, and require a different sort of support. Um, they actually may want to self-serve, but with these new demands, um, their old self-service models may not be working for them. Um, and across all of this, uh, obviously, they, you know, we, we want to be providing our customers a great experience, and that's really key. So knowledge management actually allows for a proactive approach to these self-service challenges, um, allows customers to find answers. Um, you can contextually provide answers depending on where they are within their journey uh, on their website, through your mobile app, et, et cetera, before issues are actually required to be escalated, which is really key, which actually does lead to, it, to a better customer experience and that decrease in call volumes that we've been looking at. Um, so, so key to what you can do with KM um, in a self-service capacity, really, um, is there are a few simple changes, particularly if you're already using knowledge management. Make sure that, that new issues or concerns are signposted. You can see, see here it's in a very visual way. Um, you, you can use KM to affect change quite quickly just by making it very easy for customers to find new information about new and relevant topics. Uh, for many of our existing KM customers, we've actually added dedicated categories. You can see here one for coronavirus um, or dedicated filtering to allow customers to really rapidly address um, where this content can be found in clear defined areas. And if you sort of take a look at, at one of our customers, which is BMW, um, they're actually able to act in real time right now to questions our customers have by providing new content around COVID-19. And I, I think something that's quite interesting is actually providing different answers to, to questions that were already there before. So, so for example, content around procedures um, or legislation, uh, put, you know, can, can I put my payments on hold for a payment holiday or booking an MOT? Some of those questions were already there, available in self-service. Uh, the, the difference is the answers are completely different. And the answers may be different again a week from now if there are more legislative changes. Um, so that inbuilt flexibility in terms of updating information in real time is absolutely key um, to provide timely and relevant information to customers um, about those sensitive subjects like payment holidays or changes in servicing agreement. Um, and this approach actually gives control and certainty to the customers that they're going to their website uh, without placing the burden on the customer to make a call or send in an email to a support center that is most certainly dealing with above average call volumes, as we, we've talked about previously. So what this means as well is that our AI-infused search algorithms um, mean that from day one, this system will understand the new context of those questions and can start clustering relevant information that's been added newly to the knowledge base without any overhead tagging and manual admin effort, which is absolutely critical to, to the agility that, that you can provide. Now, looking at the other side of the, the coin in terms of knowledge for employees, um, what we've seen more and more is that agents are now working from home. And this is a brand new experience, I think, for, for a lot of us, actually. There's that dual challenge of having to shift to an at-home model, as well as provide training and support. Um, increases in call volume in certain areas, and perhaps huge drops in, in other areas. So, so loads are shifting, as are the subjects and topics that we're expecting our agents to have expertise about. Um, it, those things are shifting as well. Um, remote working in and of itself has its own challenges, access to I IT systems, um, infrastructure, et cetera. Um, and cloud-based knowledge management is actually a key component of addressing many of these challenges um, because it provides a way for at-home agents to access relevant information in real time through your existing tech and infrastructure, and, and that's really key. Um, it also addresses the issues of providing agents easily consumable information on subjects they may not be used to supporting. And, and that's where it really comes into its own in terms of multi-skilling your, your agents. Um, with remote workers really now the default, um, a reliance on tools for communication rather than sort of huddles or team meetings is, is becoming more and more important. And knowledge management actually allows you to deliver communication centrally in a really consistent way and also target them even to particular teams. 
Um, so agents can see how many items they need to look at that are outstanding. Team leaders can see who's consumed, read, and understood the information. And having, having this bi-directional feedback is really key to improving that connection with your teams that may now be working from home. Uh, we've seen huge increases actually in employee engagement uh, through, through, this particular, through this particular model. So if you take a look at uh, one of our customers, which is Equinity, and they're a leading specialist in uh, technology, finance, and administrative services in really highly regulated markets, um, such as online stock portfolio management, for example. Um, they, they saw over a 50% inbound increase of calls due to COVID-19 related issues and had two days to redeploy a multi-skill agents required to take those calls. And they used uh, Verant's KM Pro product to do that. Um, and what, what they said, said to me, which was great, is that they, now, they have the confidence that the agents they have um, have the information they need to support their customers. And, and this is undergoing quite a lot of change, again, in quite a highly regulated industry as well. They've been able to get the information and retrain the, their agents over a very short period of time. The, the Very Group is another one of our customers. They're one of the largest integrated retail and financial services providers. So they operate multiple online shopping brands alongside financing options for, for the, the, the purchase of products. So a real mixture of online retail and financial services. Um, and I, I think what's key here is so they've used Verant's KM system to ensure their advisors have the latest information uh, to deal with customer queries effectively. But I think more importantly now is that they're able to cross skill that those people to deal with multiple queries. So, so when the agents you are working with um, are varied in numbers or predictability, that's something that you really want to focus on. When you're looking at any industry really, compliance is important, particularly when things are changing very rapidly. So having flexible multi-tiered approval layers is, is absolutely key. And then the changes made can be retained. So you know any change to the permanent record, feedback, who made them, et cetera. And we're actually able to provide a KM platform that has full role-based access in place. So if you need to give certain information to certain agents, uh, certain teams, um, or, or even have specific COVID-related workflows or approval processes, that, that all can be built into the, into the KM system. Now, looking really at the business case for knowledge in, in a crisis, many of the items you see there are, are really important KPIs that you'd see in almost any business case. But I think we're looking at them now through a slightly different lens. Um, the importance of being able to provide online resolution proactively right, right now is absolutely key. Uh, reducing those support escalations, and I, I know it's something that we've all um, re reiterated, but, but also that, that that's important. Reducing agent training time through the ability of um, surfacing that information to people at their fingertips. And all of that does play into the customer satisfaction that you're providing your customers now. So when we look at how, how do we effectively use KM now um, and what's the fastest way to deploy a solution, um, if you have existing an existing variant KM platform, we can help you add new and relevant COVID-19 categories now very quickly. Um, with any new solutions, particularly for at-home agents, we can stand up a cloud solution in weeks, um, providing the expertise necessary to get information your agents need now directly to them, regardless of location. Um, and we have a COVID-19 offering that focuses specifically on getting you up and running within weeks, but actually built on the, the KM Pro platform that I've been talking about that can be extended for, for other use cases and new audiences and future digital transformation. So really adapting with you um, both now and, and into the future. So now I'm going to turn back to Kelly, um, who's going to talk a bit about using digital channels. Thanks, Heather, and thanks, everybody. Uh, we've got two more strategies, um, and then we will open up to, to take some questions. So I think digital channels are important to talk about anytime you're talking about trying to shift um, some of these calls away from that phone channel. Digital channels are a nice bridge between self-service and assisted service because you are still interacting with a human, um, but not on that phone channel, on perhaps a lower cost uh, channel like chat or email. Um, and so this can be a nice bridge for, for your customers who 
are not quite comfortable trying to find an answer completely on their own, um, but they're open to the idea of, of not waiting on hold for seven hours to, uh, to get through to um, a live agent on the phone. So um, just some, some general best practices before I dive into the specific channels is you want to really make sure these options are prominently displayed on your site. Now you probably already have at least one or the other of chat and email available on your site. And, and by the way, if you don't, we can help you stand something up uh, quickly, but I'm assuming many of you already have some digital channels available, but you may want to adjust how your customers can get to them. Um, at the very least, those channels should be available on the contact page and on the support pages, um, because as a customer, is looking for your phone number on the contact page, make sure that they're seeing, hey, you can also email, you can also chat. Or as they're in self-service trying to find an answer on your support page, if they're having trouble with their self-service session, if they're having trouble getting an answer on their own, make sure they have an easy opportunity to transition that to assisted service. Now you may even want to put these options on your home page um, to make sure they're front and center and people know they can get in touch right now. Just be aware if you do that, you will see a spike in usage of those channels. So be ready from a staffing perspective to pull people from different channels to handle the uh, in incoming inquiries from chat or email, whichever one you put on your home page. So it, it is a good option to do that to, to really pull things off the phone. But again, just be ready from a, a staffing perspective. The second important best practice is to keep that information current. Just like Heather finished talking about updating that knowledge base and making sure you're adding all that new information, even if it's the same question, it might have a different answer. You want to keep all that current as well for the agents who are answering questions in chat and email. And if possible, you want to do that in the exact same way. You want to have the knowledge base that Heather talked about linked up with those channels so that you only have to be updating things in one place. That's your ideal solution. And then one last best practice just to keep things easy is to pre-populate these forms as much as possible for your customers. If they're already a customer and logged in on your site, help pre-populate that so that when they say they need to chat, they're straight into the chat and they don't have to fill out five different fields about their email address and their name and all of that. That's just a nice way to make things easy so that we're trying to make getting in touch as, as easy as possible. A couple quick things on the individual channels. Now email, it's really important to think about how, how ideal email is for what you may have a big bulk of employees that are now time shifted. You know, perhaps they used to work eight to five, but now from eight to five, they've got rowdy kids in the house, um, you know, that they're trying to homeschool. And so that, that isn't going to work for them anymore, but they're free in the evenings and they can put in an eight hour uh, shift in the evenings. Now, maybe you're not getting a lot of phone calls in the evenings, but you can put that employee on email, and so they can handle your emails during that time. Some best practices for email is to use guided forms. Just a free form box of, hey, send us an email, that's going to be a lot more time consuming for your agents to respond to. But if you can have some drop downs and choices of what is, what is your issue about, that's going to help you route your, your emails and help speed up the resolution. Another way to speed up that resolution is through templates and auto responses. So have these auto responses ready for your common questions to really reduce that time to response. And then finally, if you're not already using secure messaging, it's something you may want to consider based on your industry. I know a lot of folks in highly regulated industries, they think, well, we've got to use the phone channel when we're talking about sensitive information, like account numbers and things. But you can also use secure messaging if you're in that banking or insur insurance industries to even send secure data through an email channel. So that's something to consider as well. As we look at the chat and messaging channels, again, this is nice because it's that real-time assistance. It's real-time contact with a human, but it's a lower cost channel and it's often more convenient for your customers and your agents. One thing you can do is combine the live chat with an agent with a virtual assistant. So Tracy talked about having these natural conversations with your virtual assistant, and you can seamlessly then transition that into a, a live chat with a human if the intents are discovered that this is a conversation that really needs to, to be handled by a human. You can naturally make that transition. And then secondly, you can use your chat platform on your social messaging um, systems as well so that you're able to 
automate and regulate how you're having conversations over things like Facebook Messenger and WhatsApp, because those conversations are likely uh, increasing in frequency as well. Now, the final uh, point I want to make about how you can um, reduce the, the number of inbound calls is to leverage your online community. And this is customers helping each other um, in this virtual space. And, you know, it kind of brings us back to talking about having this human connection that Daniel talked about with talking about the importance of the phone. We don't have a ton of human connection right now. And online communities are a way to do that, to, to let customers help one another, provide timely information. Sometimes your customers, you know, things are changing so quick. If you've got specific regional information and the mayor of a city just made a particular announcement, you know, you may get answers from people um, in that region faster than the, the company can get some formalized content up. But you also can transition that community content into knowledge content, like Heather was talking about. The community is a great way to discover some of these new topics that should be added to your knowledge base. So another uh, great way to find that relevant content. Now we had a, a webinar, uh, the first one in this series talked at length about the community. So I'm not going to talk too much about it. If the online community is something that you think would be helpful either for your employees or your customers, definitely go back and, um, and, and listen to the first webinar of our series and you'll, you'll hear a lot about it as well as um, the special program that we have going on right now to help get you set up very quickly, a rapid deployment of about 10 business days um, if you want to stand this up and use it to help your employees um, get timely updates as well. So with that, I want to make sure we leave plenty of time for questions. I did see um, quite a few questions come in. If you haven't asked your question yet, uh, please type it into the Q&A box. Um, so hopefully these seven strategies were, are helpful to you to find different ways that you can handle this influx of questions um, and figure out what are the right ones that need to get in to that phone channel and then how, what's the best way to handle the others. So we'll take some live questions now and then uh, if you can stay, please stay till after the questions are over. I have a couple really important uh, events to talk about that are upcoming with Varent. So stay tuned for those in the last uh, couple of minutes. But I will now take a look. Let's see, I'll try to organize these in some way. Let's, um, let's start with Daniel. Daniel, can you provide a specific example of how customers are using speech analytics during this crisis? Yeah, we, we, we have quite a few. Um, actually, I, I, you know, the, the, definitely stay on for Kelly's session because we have two customers presenting next week about ways they're using speech specifically. Um, so that could be in a lot more detail. But the main thing is really seeing the shift in calls. One, one example was in a collections environment. So, Obviously, because of the stress people are in, financial stress, um, a collections department has really changed their role. Um, you know, less outbound calls, more inbound calls to support, um, you know, delaying, understanding the people in a temporary situation. So it's changing their policies almost in real time to address the changing environment and switching their mode uh, and, and the, the level of empathy that they typically provide to really changing policies and strategy. We've had another large telecom provider that um, the CEO announced that they would be um, waiving fees or waiving late fees and, and payments, uh, but not all that didn't necessarily trickle down to all the agents. So using speech, we analyzed and we found that there was, uh, you know, many of the agents were not really following that new policy. They were just either for not knowing about it or just forgetting to note it. So adjusting that quickly based on the insight. So there's quite a lot of examples, but I do recommend, you know, hearing it directly from some customers next week. Great, thanks. Um, Heather, I see two here for you around knowledge management. Um, the first is, how do I build up my knowledge base quickly? I don't have a lot of authored content right now. Okay, you know, that, that's a great question. And, and it's one that I think is probably the most commonly asked question when you get into a discussion about knowledge management generally. Um, what, what I always say to customers is start, start crowdsourcing first. If, if you go and even speak to, to you know, some, some of your top agents, that they will be able to reel off the top of their head um, quite a lot of content that could be immediately added to a knowledge base. Um, the, the second is look at any collaterals that you're currently using. 
um, either to support your agents or anything that you have online for your customers. And we can provide tools to, to turn that in to, to curated content quickly. The, the key thing, though, is to not be worried about having everything in to begin with. Um, and, and I think that if you're using a knowledge management system that can provide you real-time analytics about where those gaps are, you can be confident in starting with actually a pretty slim uh, amount of content and start adding it based on the questions that are being asked. And that's a really key capability, especially for something like now, where the issues that your customers or agents may have are shifting so, so rapidly. So, so it's a combination, I think, of crowdsourcing the knowledge first, um, not worrying about getting it all in to begin with, and then absolutely using the analytics provided. To, to start updating and um, growing the, the knowledge base in real time based on usage. Great. So you said that was the most common question. This, this next one that I saw, this is, I think, one of the other most common questions that I, that I hear about knowledge. Um, this person asks, do I start first with self-service or the contact center when deploying knowledge? Uh, that, 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 that's the question, isn't it? You know what, and typically, and I think for quite a while, the recommendation was always start with your contact center, grow out your knowledge until you're comfortable with it, and then surface that to your customers. What I'm, what I'm seeing more and more is that that rule book's kind of being thrown out the window with the advent of KM systems that you can be using to support one, the other, or, or both. Um, and basically, I would say take a look at your own organizational needs and where you have the resources to stand something up fastest and start there. Um, particularly now, that the last thing you want to do is to, to try, you know, could put a, a square peg into a, a circular hole, as it were. So, so, so look at where you have the, the most pain and the resources to address it and start there. Just make sure that you're using a KM system that can then be rolled out to address those other use cases as and when you organizationally are, are ready to go through that process. Yep, good point. Uh, okay, Tracy, I see two questions here, but I'm gonna smash them together because they're on a related topic, so you can kind of hit both. So the first question, they're, they're both about the special program you have for the work from home. Um, the first question is who do I off, who do I um, contact if I'm interested in getting started with that work from home program? And then um, the second question is um, if I want to get started on this work from home intelligent assistant, what type of resources would my company need to have? So can you kind of address both of those? Sure, we can do that probably pretty quickly. Um, so from a who to contact standpoint, um, because like I mentioned, this is an offer for our variant customers, just reach out to your variant account executives. Um, they'll be able to assist you with uh, more detail and information around that. There will also be um, information on the variant website for you. So those would be the two places to go to get that quickly answered. As far as resources goes, what we've done is we have pre-built um, and defined and, and built out all the natural language understanding needed to support the work from um, home intelligent assistant. The resource that your organization would need would be really one to um, support the, the responses, right? So we understand that somebody's asking about uh, PTO requirements or changes with COVID-19. We would need somebody from the organization to provide what your specific uh, policy is on that um, so that we can put that into the system so that it's very customized for your need um, from that perspective. And then, of course, um, it needs to be on an intranet um, or on an internal website. So there's a little piece of, of code that sits there uh, that we would provide. So very lightweight. Uh, we've done all the build and lift. We just need to be able to get that into your experts' uh, hands so that they can uh, put your very specific company information in it. Great. Thank you. Okay, see, so we only have uh, about five minutes left. So if, if we didn't get to your question, again, we will respond to you via email. Um, I do want to talk about what is coming next because we have uh, a lot of really great um, episodes, if you will, in this webinar series coming up um, in the remainder of this month. So as Daniel mentioned, next week we have two live customers that are that'll be speaking uh, one on Tuesday one on Thursday so we'll hear from Navy Federal Credit Union about how they specifically are using speech analytics to understand um, the nature of the issues their customers are having how many calls to expect 
uh, when they can expect payments to be made. It's going to be a really good interview um, with Navy Federal. And then later that week, we'll be talking with the CEO of Everize. Everize is a BPO based in Asia. And so we'll be talking um, with their CEO about how they're enabling customer experience excellence while their employees are working from home. So two great customer stories of, of real world examples. And then the following week, we are lucky to, to hear from experts from Forrester Research. So we have two different sessions from Forrester about uh, using conversational AI and then about customer experience transformation. So um, stay tuned for um, all of those webinars. You can sign up for them. Uh, the registration form is in the resource list uh, that you will have from this event. So if you check out the resources uh, for this event, you can, you can sign up for those uh, upcoming sessions. The other big thing that I wanted to let all of our customers and our partners know about is that we uh, are having a virtual customer engagement conference. Um, the registration page is up as of today, so you can sign up. Um, we're really excited to explore a new way to connect with you guys virtually. Um, so we've set up this uh, virtual customer engagement conference on May 20th and 21st. Again, in your resource list, you'll see um, a link of how you can register for that event, and we're really looking forward to uh, connecting with a lot of you and again, customers and our partners uh, at that event. One final wrap up is just to let you know if there's other materials you need. That resource tab as well has some other um, articles and assets that might be helpful. If you're looking for a recording of this event, you will receive an email with a link back to this recording. Um, and if you want to share that with your, your coworkers, please do so and go back and check out the recordings to any of the previous webinars uh, that we've had in this series. And then finally, anything else that you guys want to ask us, um, if you don't know who to get in touch with, you can always start with info at varent.com and we will get your question to the right person. Um, but also reach out to your account exec if you are in touch with them for any specific needs that you have right now um, based on the challenges that this pandemic is bringing to your organization. Everybody has a little bit of a different situation, uh, but we want to help you get through this. And so please get in touch with us um, and please sign up for the, the next webinars, the ones that sound interesting to you. And, and we hope to provide you with even more helpful information to, um, so you can adapt and respond uh, during these very strange times. So with that, thank you so much to my speakers and thank you so much to all of you who attended. I hope you're all staying safe and well and we will speak to you soon.